It is now time for question period. Member from Perry Salmon, Ms. Smoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Uh, I, like many Ontarians, was shocked at yesterday's decision by Cliffs Natural Resources to pull out of the Ring of Fire. What is truly unfortunate is the amount of unheeded warnings that your government received throughout the process. The Premier deflected my questions here in the House numerous times, and one instead chose to reminisce about paddling on the Attawapiskat River. Acting Premier, back in April, Bill Boer, Senior Vice President of Cliffs, said, quote, company officials have yet to talk with representatives of Premier Kathleen Wynne's government. He went on, quote, as we approach a year since the agreement in terms that, that be that's become more of a concern, close quote. In September, he said, since last winter's provincial Question. leadership change, talks with Queen's Park have stalled. Oh, Acting Premier, it is clear that the blame lies squarely on the shoulders of your government. Who in your government is going to be held accountable you. for your failure on this matter? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, Minister, I will uh, speaker, I'll refer this to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Northern Development and Mines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Let me begin by saying that our, our government, our province, remains absolutely committed right. to seeing smart, sustainable, and collaborative de development in the Ring of Fire project. This is an extraordinary multi-generational economic development activity, no minimal potential worth $60 billion, and we know that there is extraordinary interest in this. And I will certainly say that I am disappointed with uh, uh, the decision uh, and the announcement that Cliff's made, and, and, but also appreciate their continued interest in the project. What's really important is that we continue to move forward to develop this project. We are going to work diligently to ensure that we are ready to support this development, and we're going to remain firmly committed to working with any and all interested parties to develop the region. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that we are we are taking strong action to move the project forward. We are bringing Thank partners you. together to uh, create a development corporation. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, again, to the acting premier, how many generations do we have to wait? Uh, exactly. Acting Premier, what is so shameful This is your government has been bragging about developing the Ring of Fire for years now. May 9, 2012, your government issued a press release that stated, thousands of jobs coming to Northern Ontario. The release also touted a refinery in Cape Real, promising to employ 450 people during the construction, as many as 450 people in 2015 when it was scheduled to be operational. Acting Premier, you sold hope to the people of Northern Ontario and have failed to deliver. First Nation communities, cities like Thunder Bay and Sudbury are all waiting for the investment jobs that this project would bring. You're sitting on the largest deposit of chromite ever discovered in North America. Question. Acting Premier, why have you failed to bring the promised jobs and prosperity that Ontario so desperately needs? Please. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, we are working incredibly hard on providing really strong action to move this project forward. We are, we, we are establishing a development corporation that will bring together any and all interested partners to this project. That certainly includes the historic uh, consultations that are undertaken with the Matawa First Nation, Order. important partners, other industry partners, let alone further discussions with clips that we intend to continue to have to bring cooperation. And may I say, Mr. Speaker, we are also making significant investments in, in communities, both First Nations and other northern communities, bringing forward and skills upgrading. But let's also make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we, we recognize how important it is to bring the federal government to the table. Right We're calling on them to be matching the funds. We are prepared to make very significant investments in this project. That commitment Answer. remains, but we need the federal government to come to the table. Yeah. The fact is they have made strong commitments to other projects, Newfoundland and Labrador, hydroelectric project. So we need you to come Thank to the table. Thank you. On the yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please.
Final supplementary. Again, to the acting premier, how did things get so far off the rails that Cliffs, the major player in the Ring of Fire, has pulled the plug on their development? You had plenty of warnings, yet even in the face of prominent miners publicly raising concerns about, quote, unresolved agreements with the government of Ontario that are critical to the project's economic viability, you insisted that the Ring of Fire was moving ahead. Well, yesterday, Cliffs announced that it would be shuttering its mining camp in the Ring of Fire, closing offices in Thunder Bay and in Toronto. Shame. Acting Premier, what do you have to say to these hardworking people who are now out of work as a direct result of your government's failure? Speaker, there continues to be an extraordinarily high level of interest among industry, among First Nations, and among May. I hope to see the federal government is seeing this project move forward. We are we are taking very strong action to move it forward. Member so from Burlington will come to order. Close relationship with Cliff. You say it, please. Because she was. Um, because she was very much engaged and probably even with my mic on didn't hear me, the member from Burlington will come to order. This project is moving forward, Mr. Speaker. There's no question about it. There's an extraordinary high level of interest, and we are going to continue to have our discussions. The formation of a development corporation is crucial to seeing this project moving forward. We are going to we are bringing together any and all partners, and I would like to actually have the uh, members of the opposition, let alone members of the third party, recognize the important work that's being done with the First Nations as well. We need to create the climate to allow the private sector to get involved. But we understand how Answer. important infrastructure is. Is. That's why we put in place the uh, Development Corporation. That's why we're going to continue to work with all our partners in this project. A $60 billion project in terms of mineral potential. Thank you. Part of the province have never seen development before. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. A month ago, my colleague from uh, Perry Sound, Muskoka, told you that Cliff said the Ring of Fire is, quote, in a tenuous state. If the company doesn't have a transportation route, it doesn't have a project. The Premier's response, she told us that this summer she paddled on the Attawapiskat River. Uh, that's not an urgent call to action. Her reply wasn't about the thousands of jobs at risk, many of them First Nations. Her reply wasn't about the wealth that could be created. No, she paddled 100 kilometres away. You and your minister were warned by Cliffs. You have absolutely bungled this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's obvious you have absolutely no plan for the North. Will you at least take and implement the PC plan for Northern Ontario? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Mr. Speaker, our, thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, our government remains absolutely committed to seeing the Ring of Fire project move forward. We are committed to smart, sustainable, and collaborative development. That is why, indeed, we have set up a, a development corporation in order to bring all the partners together. That's going to be crucial in terms of making the kinds of decisions we need to make related to infrastructure. We recognize how important it is to make the right decisions about infrastructure, and that's the work that we're going to be doing. We need to bring our partners to the table. We are working, doing extraordinary work with our First Nations. We need to bring the federal government to the table. They've, made some, they've supported many other projects. Clearly, that's crucial. We'd sure like to have you over on that side of the House uh, join our call to have them reach our matching funds. The fact is, this project, and we're doing extraordinarily hard work, we'll continue to do hard work. The Ring of Fire project remains an absolute Answer. priority for our Premier. We recognize the economic development opportunities, the thousands of jobs that will be created, and we remain committed. Confident that indeed Thank you. the hard work that we're doing will make. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Well, thank you for creating another panel. Uh, Deputy Premier, our leader, Tim Hudak, led a group of uh, us MPPs up to the Ring of Fire site. We all saw firsthand the two actual mine sites that were going to be developed. Each would have seen a $3 billion investment. The transportation route adds another billion dollars. Last week, I had the privilege of touring Cliff's proposed smelter site in Capriol, and I must say, it really is a fascinating 4,000-acre site and a further $3 billion investment that would have happened. Guys, you just blew a 
10 billion dollar deal of a lifetime and you're about to put more people out of work much of that exploration drill bits and drill rods are, are manufactured in my riding of north bay and powassan uh, and cliffs was spending four million dollars a month here in toronto will what will you tell those families who are getting their pink slips this morning Minister. It is absolutely startling to how stunningly dismissive the member is about a development corporation that's being welcomed by industry, that's being welcomed by the First Nations, something that will help us move this project forward in a way that it needs to happen. It certainly is interesting coming from a party as well that is part of their PC platform or white paper. We're talking about actually dismantling, discarding, sh shutting down the Ministry of Northern Development. And oh, shame. Oh, shame. So that's, that's right there in your, in your platform. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we remain absolutely committed to this project. We are taking strong action to move it forward. The formation of the development corporation is absolutely vital. We need the federal government's involvement. We have the province's commitment to significant investment. The industry partners are interested. This is a huge project with a great deal of interest. We look forward to continuing our conversation with Cliffs. And certainly the partners that are involved in this are going to bring this project forward. We are going to make this project happen, and we are going to continue the hard work that's needed. Thank you. To create the right climate. Thank you. Stop the clock. You see them, please? You see them, please? I'm, uh, I'm going to ask that. Uh, let me try again. I'm going to ask that we tone it down. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex will come to order. <coughs> Final supplementary. Speaker, Speaker, I have to tell you how appalled I am at a standing ovation for losing $10 billion jobs here in Ontario. Deputy Premier, uh, last week we learned that Heinz is shuttering their plant in Leamington and shedding a thousand mostly full-time people. And we also learned that while you were warned in advance, you did nothing. Cliffs warned you a month ago that the project needed urgent uh, action, and again, you nothing. did absolutely nothing. Your Premier went canoeing and jogging, but you did nothing. These companies, despite their warnings, which now have come true. And I'm sorry, now you're disappointed. The Northern Minister says, don't worry, the rock is in the ground, it's not going anywhere. This is a multi-generational opportunity. Well, my question, Speaker, is which generation did you have in mind to finally get around to doing something? Here, here, here. You see the face? You see the face? Minister? Politics. Mr. Speaker, indeed we are disappointed by Cliff's decision, I, and I do appreciate that they continue to express interest in the project. They have spoken about suspending it indefinitely, but the, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to have conversations with them, and the fact Remember is from Oxford, that we are moving forward door. with the project in a most definitive and a very action-oriented way, and that's exactly why we have formed the, uh, the Development Corporation. We recognize uh, this, it, this was a business decision by Cliff's, and I respect that, and I'll let them speak for themselves, but we are absolutely committed to seeing this project move forward and this development corporation is absolutely key to seeing this project move forward we know we recognize how important infrastructure decisions are we are prepared to make a significant investment the province is committed to that investment we need the federal government on board but we also want to bring together the other industry partners who have expressed a strong interest in this project they're committed to it this is going to move forward this project remains an extraordinary priority Thank you. for our province no question the leader of the third party Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. In 2010, the current Premier and other members of the Liberal Cabinet announced that Cliffs Natural Resources would be building a refinery outside of Sudbury. When exactly did the government first learn that the Cliffs project was in jeopardy? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have been, we've been working closely with Cliffs over the last couple of years, and we recognize that the decision that they made, uh, um, or announced that they made yesterday, is, is very disappointing. The fact is that we are continuing to move, work, work, move forward on the Ring of Fire project, as I would hope the leader of the third party would want us to do, and I hope that she will join us in, in doing the work that we need to do. We need to, uh, to, put, to do a number of actions to make this project come to fruition, and those are the actions that we're taking, which is why, indeed, working on the Development Corporation is absolutely crucial. 
why it's so important for us to, to work, continue our, our work on historic consultations with the uh, Matawa First Nations, which is why we need to continue to make the investments that we made to, uh, to have skills upgrading and communities ready in terms of capacity building. Those, that's the work that we're going to continue to do. This is a huge project. There is $60 billion of mineral potential. Answer. We, we, are, we are going to see this project move forward, and we're going to continue to take strong action to see that that happens. Thank you. Supplementary. Beyond issuing a press release announcing, quote, thousands of jobs coming, what steps did the government take in 2010 to ensure that the jobs that they had so confidently announced were actually going to appear, Speaker? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the economic development potential for this project remains very much the same. The project is a, has got a mineral potential of $60 billion. There is extraordinary interest in this project, and that interest continues with Cliffs Natural Resources. And, but there are other companies as well who are very interested in, in moving forward on this project. We are, we, are, we are going to continue to take strong action to move the project forward. And it would be great to have the uh, third party, as well as other members of the opposition, supporting us in moving together with the Development Corporation. We've got very interested partners from industry, from the First Nations. We're open to have discussions with them very, very soon. And the fact is we need the federal government on board as well. We recognize there's lots of, this is a multifaceted Answer. project. Nobody argues with that, but we are gonna move this project forward. We continue to remain absolutely, absolutely committed to it. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the uh, minister didn't mention any steps that they took in 2010 or 2011 or 2012. Two weeks ago, the minister issued another press release pledging to create a development corporation for the Ring of Fire. When the minister made that announcement, Speaker, did he already know that Cliffs would be pulling out? Minister, um, as, the, um, as the leader will know, there were some very encouraging, positive comments that were expressed after we announced the creation of the Development Corporation, and those comments will continue. We are having very important discussions, already, already had very important discussions with a number of potential partners for the Development Cor Corporation, and those will continue. In fact, they will be redoubled. We recognize how important it is to, to make decisions related to infrastructure, and the way to do that, I think, is to bring the potential partners together. So certainly, that includes discussions with members of, of industry who are obviously very much involved in the Ring of Fire, recognizing the long-term, let alone the me medium-term, economic development potential for this all across Northern Ontario in terms of the creation of jobs. That's still our priority. The fact is, again, we need to have the federal government join us in matching funds. We've seen them support other major projects across the country. We need them at the table. I look forward to having an opportunity to sit down with the federal ministry. The various Thank federal you. ministers say they're committed to the project. We need them at the New question, the leader of the third party. This question is for the Minister of uh, Northern Development and Mine Speaker. And you know what? Nobody likes the blame game. We don't want a blame game. We want jobs in this province. That's what the government should be focusing on, not the blame game. A lot of people actually are counting on the jobs and prosperity that the natural resources of the Ring of Fire actually bring. But they worry that the Development Corporation announcement is once again about a desperate government scrambling to get ahead of bad news instead of getting something done for the people who need jobs. Can the minister provide any detail whatsoever about this de Development Corporation that he announced two weeks ago, Speaker? Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is certainly not about the blame game. This is about bringing all of our partners together on a project with extraordinary economic and development potential work. for Northern Ontario, a project with extraordinary mineral potential up to $60 billion. We are very committed to seeing this project move forward. The Development Corporation will bring those partners together, bring industry together. We hope to, uh, to bring First Nations as, as partners to the project as well. We certainly are inviting the federal government to join us for that project as well. The fact is that's the key to making the uh, decisions that certainly need to be made related to infrastructure, related to a transportation corridor, and that's why we are so keen to move this development corporation forward. So may I say, Mr. Speaker, this project continues to be a huge priority for us. The opportunities for economic development and jobs in the North continue to be enormous, and that's why we are staying so committed to this extraordinarily important project. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier promised that thousands of jobs were coming. Those were her words. But once again, when people desperate for work look beyond the press releases, they see a government without any plans 
any details or, frankly, any idea what they are doing. The only jobs the Liberals seem to rally about and seem to really care about is their own jobs. Speaker, does the minister have any evidence whatsoever that Liberals took, look, took anything, um, any meaningful steps whatsoever? to actually deliver on the jobs that they had promised, the thousands of jobs that they had promised back when the Premier promised them. Minister. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that we've seen some really interesting opportunities for the mining supply and services sector that have come out as a result of the opportunities we're going to be seeing in the ring of fire. But in terms of the actions that we have taken, I do hope that the, the Leader of Third Party would recognize how important our historic consultations with the Matawa First Nations are. Clearly, we need to work with them, and we are very much uh, happy to work with them. Bob Ray representing the Matawa First Nations, uh, Frank Yakabuchi representing the provincial government. It's absolutely crucial the First Nations see those benefits, and in fact, I know uh, the Leader of the Third Party has called on us to make that happen. That's a very important part of the process, as is the fact that we need to bring our in all of our partners together in this development corporation. That will be a key element in moving this project forward. We need to make decisions related to infrastructure. This will allow and us sir. to make those decisions, and certainly, again, Mr. Speaker, I can only say how strongly committed we are to seeing this project move forward. It's a huge priority for us. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, across Ontario, people are worried about jobs, and they see unemployment above the national average, 300,000 jobs lost in manufacturing, and the highest electricity rates in the entire country, in fact, the entire continent. And their government reaction is a promise to conduct studies, strike panels, and churn out press releases. Beyond the talk, we keep seeing the same old status quo, Speaker. How can anybody take this government's job plan seriously when it's obviously written on the back of an envelope or maybe on the back of a press release? Minister. Mr. Speaker, our, our role and our commitment is to see, get the best value possible for, for all Ontarians, and that's exactly what we are doing with the Ring of Fire project. We all understand it is, a true, it is truly a multi-generational opportunity with a huge mineral potential, and we recognize that the, need, the right decisions need to be made and the right climate needs to be provided. That's the hard work that we have been doing, and that, yeah, that speaks to the hard work that we will continue to be doing. We continue to be very, very excited about the the opportunities, but it's important that we do it right, which is why, indeed, establishing a development corporation was such a key part of the process. It's why, indeed, the historic consultations with the Matawa First Nations are so absolutely vital. It's why the uh, investments that we've made in skills upgrading and community capacity building is so important. Answer. This is all part of a large project. We're committed to it. We're going to stay committed to it. It's a huge Thank you. project. We're going to move it forward. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Sarnia Lampton. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, yesterday Imperial Oil in Sarnia announced it would close its blending division at Sarnia, citing inability to be competitive in Ontario. This means a lost jobs and investment in Imperial, lost jobs and opportunities for the local trades, and lost business for local suppliers, and lost tax revenue for the city of Sarnia. Deputy Premier, will you do anything to kickstart our economy or generate investment in Ontario? And did you do anything to compete for those jobs in Imperial and the supporting jobs in the local community? Unbelievable. To the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is precisely why a year ago we created the South Western Ontario Development Fund, a fund which has actually helped to create and retain more than 6,000 jobs in Southwestern. Order. Order. I don't get things quiet for the last chop shots. Carry on. So, Mr. Speaker, of course, the party opposite the PCs chose not to support that. Member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, will come to order. 
responsible for creating and retaining 6,000 jobs in southwestern Ontario. Last week, I met with Imperial Oil out in Calgary. I also met with another important Sarnia company, Nova Chemicals, headquartered in Calgary. I had meetings with both of them. I have great confidence in the chemical and petrochemical industry in that part of Ontario, and I will continue to work hard to make sure that we uh, support investments, incent the creation of new jobs, and it is succeeding, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Deputy Premier, back to the Deputy Premier again. Uh, you might ask how that fund's working out for you. Imperial Oil, founded in Lambton County in 1880, and it's had over, uh, been over 100 years in Sarnia and created great jobs. After 10 years of your Liberal government skyrocketing energy prices and anti-business policies, companies across this province are heading for greener pastures. Uh, Deputy Premier, we saw it at Leamington's Heinz facility last week and other uh, cliffs just announced today, and of course, in Imperial Oil and Sarnia. Deputy Premier, the hits keep adding up. Will you finally agree that your government is bad for business in Ontario? It's time for a change from the team that's leading Ontario. Just apologize and resign. Yeah. Thank you. Attorney General. Attorney General. You, uh, you ain't seen the speaker, Matt. No, you have nowhere close. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, as the official opposition continues to denigrate and talk down our manufacturing sector, as I mentioned, just last week I met with two companies that had their bases in the Sarnia-Lampton area. I met with their executives to continue to promote investment in that important area. And I need to remind the legislature as well, of course, that the PCs opposed back in 2008 the support that we provided to the auto sector. If they had have got their way, Mr. Speaker, GM and Chrysler would not even be in this province in any, anymore. Instead, we have a record sales year for cars in this in this country. We're very proud of what is happening in our with our businesses and our manufacturers. We continue to invest in that sector. Thank you. Your question, the member from Alberta, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. For over five years. The Liberal government has failed to develop a framework for northern development in the Ring of Fire. But this inaction hasn't stopped the government from issuing press releases touting opportunities that they've done no work to develop. Cliffs, the biggest player in the Ring of Fire, pulled out announcement is not only a blow to job creation in the province, but demonstrates most clearly that this government has no plan for northern job creation. If this government is actually doing work, why can't we get a briefing on what this development corporation plan is, which is the government belatedly announced two weeks ago? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have a very clear and, and detailed action plan for the Ring of Fire project. That is why we, we are so keen to move forward with the development corporation. And while I appreciate that the, uh, the member and, and the third party may want to play politics with this, this issue, the fact is that we are work, moving forward in a number of direct ways to move it forward. That certainly includes the, uh, the establishment of the development corporation, which is crucial to bringing all the partners together. It certainly includes the historic consultations with the First Nation, which are vital. It it includes our capacity building. In terms of a, a briefing, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would certainly be very pleased to. We had an opportunity to discuss this uh, yesterday, and we'd, we'll be very pleased to uh, have that uh, set up for you. Uh, but in terms of the project itself, absolute commitment for us continues to be a huge uh, opportunity for, for Northern Ontario, continue to be a huge economic Sir. development potential for jobs. We're going to continue to work to develop, to keep working on our action plan to move this project forward. Right Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, a plan to enact a plan to implement a plan to put in a plan into action is not action. The Ring of Fire is once in a lifetime opportunity for people in Ontario. Last year, this government made a big announcement that it had reached a deal with Cliffs that would create processing jobs in Capriol, that would build infrastructure. Last night's announcement sadly proves that there was no deal. No plan and that government in action on this opportunity is costing the province jobs. Why did the government stall for five years instead of creating a framework for developing the job creation in the Ring of Fire? Mr. Speaker, 
we, uh, we had a, have, have had a, a very close working relationship with Clips, and we will continue to speak with them about this. There are other companies who are very, very interested in the Ring of Fire development as well. This is a huge uh, economic development opportunity, which everyone in uh, this house certainly knows about and many people in the province know about. That's why we have got a clear plan moving forward. That's why we have made it so important to invest in skills upgrading. That's why we have invested significantly in capacity building. That's why we are involved in these historic consultations with the First Nation. The member opposite understands how important that is, and perhaps most critically, that's why we are so excited about the establishment of a development corporation, because we recognize that indeed that will be Answer. the key together all the partners to move this project forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Vaughan. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Community, Serv uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services. The Ontario Provincial Police is responsible for policing almost 1 million square kilometres of land across our province, over 100,000 square kilometres of waterways, and two-thirds of the municipalities in a province that makes up almost 40 per cent of the country's population. Day in and day out, Speaker, OPP officers are patrolling our roads and highways, helping Ontarians where they're in need, when they're in need, and providing excellent police service to keep communities safe. Our government and the OPP are committed, Speaker, to ensuring the safety of all Ontarians. Like all first responders, OPP officers are running towards danger, Speaker, when everyone else is running to safety. On Tuesday, our government introduced Bill 133, an act to amend the Ontario Provincial Police Collective Question. Bargaining Act. Could the minister please explain to the House the intentions behind this bill. Thank you, Minister of Community thank Safety you, uh, and Corruption Mr. Speaker, Services. I want to thank the uh, member from uh, Vaughan for this question. I couldn't agree more with his comment uh, this morning. OPP officers are vital to Ontario. If our communities are not safe, then we cannot build the successful, compassionate, and united province that I believe all parties have here are striving for. But we need to level the playing field for the OPP officers. So th this bill, if it's passed, will amend the Ontario Provincial Police uh, Collective Agreement Act 2006 and would make the labor right of OPP officer consistent with the right of officer working for municipal police Excellent. services. Excellent. So we want to make the system fairer across the province, and I really look forward to working closely with both the opposition party who have uh, endorsed uh, this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, it's great to hear from the minister that we are making efforts to make sure that lab more labor rights, uh, to make labor rights consistent for all police officers in Ontario. So I understand, Speaker, the proposed changes would move the management rights clause out of the legislation and into the collective agreements for uniformed and civilian staff. Speaker, I have a two-pronged follow-up question for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. If the bill is passed, Speaker, how many uniformed and civilian staff will be impacted by the changes? And secondly, were these amendments meant to pass as part of the budget? Thank you, Minister. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. If passed, the ch these uh, changes would ensure more consistency between the OPP uh, Police Association collective bargaining. And uh, with that said, 9,000 OPPA members would be impacted. Mr. Speaker, these amendments were meant to pass as part of the 2012 budget. The removal of these measures in committee was an error and one that the other parties agree was not intentional. Okay. So I know this item is uh, something that the official opposition and the third party supports. I believe this gives us a great opportunity to show Ontarians that we can work together on common goals, and I really look forward to that opportunity. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to show my great appreciation for these nine thousand men and women who works with the OPP on an everyday basis. Answer, thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from Kitchener, comes forward. Yes, thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Acting Premier. Premier, I continue to point out uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has in fact ruled that profits made of, uh, off of revenue-neutral programs like Drive Clean are an illegal tax and must be repaid. Illegal. So I was surprised to see that your Environment Minister ignored the letter I sent him earlier this month outlining how the Liberal government could bring itself in line with Canadian law. It's quite simple, actually. First, stop imposing illegal taxes today. Second, pay back the $19 million that's been taken from the pockets of Ontario drivers. 
but you continue to refuse to take either of these steps. Deputy Premier, how do you expect Ontarians to have any respect for your government when you have no respect for Canadian law? Wow. To the Minister of Finance. Sure, finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, as noted in the uh, fall economic statement, we are addressing uh, drive clean. We want it to be revenue neutral. We know that the work done over the many years with the drive clean program has helped to improve our quality of life and protect public health and also reduce emissions. We also mentioned at great length uh, the need to provide for consumer protection. It's not just drive clean. We're also looking at ways to control uh, cell phone use and, and, and contract pricing to save consumers more money. And in this case, we will do our effort to ensure that Drive Clean remains revenue neutral, notwithstanding the fact that over many years it was subsidized and the taxpayers were actually covering the, the excess costs of the Drive Clean program throughout that time. Thank you. Supplementary. So we'll float the law. Back to the acting uh, premier. We'll the Ontario the PC party has now been calling on the Liberals to scrap Drive Clean for more than two and a half years. And now nearly everyone agrees it's time to phase out the program. In fact, even officials in your own environment Attorney ministry General. say it's time to end drive clean because the program has in fact outlived its usefulness. Now I couldn't help but notice that the NDP leader hinted earlier this week that she'll support keeping this temporary program running indefinitely if you lower the fees by a couple of bucks. So. Deputy Premier, will you continue to force Ontario drivers to pay hundreds of dollars for your faulty e-test as a result of your collusion with the NDP? Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, the drive clean program brought forward by the other government, no less, was a good move. It is about saving lives. It is about. It's, it's also about controlling emissions, improving. The, the, the environment in which we live, and it has taken hold, and we have made a lot of advancements. We will continue to work with the program to ensure that it's revenue neutral and reduce the cost of consumers to protect the interests of all concerned. Mr. Speaker, I think that's an appropriate thing for us to do. Exactly. Thank you. No question. The member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development and Trade. Less than a week after Heinz announced it would close its Leamington plant, we learned that Heinz will invest $28 million to expand its facility in Ohio and create almost 250 new jobs there. Get this! The reason they chose Ohio was the state-enabled job creation tax credit that netted Heinz $513,000 for moving Leamington jobs there. New Democrats have long called for a similar job creation tax credit here in Ontario. 740 people will be, will be out of work in Leamington, and 46 Aereo tomato growers will lose a significant contract because of this government's inaction. Why did this government ignore the advice of New Democrats and refuse to implement a job creation tax credit that would keep jobs here in Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. And of course, uh, I think all of us are disappointed, very disappointed, with the decision of Heinz to close the plant in Leamington. Of course, they're also closing two plants in the United States as well, and they made this uh, based on business decisions. Uh, however, we've been working very hard. I've spoken with the local officials, the local MPP, of course. Uh, my staff have been on the ground yesterday meeting with members of the supply chain to make sure that we do whatever we can for them. Tomorrow, I've got my, uh, my ministry together with uh, training colleges and universities, sitting down with the union, the employees. We're looking at all possible options. In fact, I'll be traveling to Leamington tomorrow myself to meet with the local officials and the leadership there, the business community, to see what we can do. And everything from repurposing the plant to uh, perhaps looking at a cooperative opportunity, but certainly our first priority is for the employees and their families and the broader Answer. community. Again, again to the minister, it is amazing that you have 10 trade offices around the world, but you don't have a Made in Ontario jobs plan. Um, on Tuesday, the Premier stood in this House and she said they had done everything that we could to keep this plant from closing, everything. But, she had, but had she created a job creation tax credit along the lines that New Democrats had suggested, there would be a good chance, there would be some hope that those 740 Leamington workers wouldn't be losing their jobs. How can this Premier claim that her government uh, did everything that they could when you out 
outright rejected a new Democrat solution that would have saved 740 Leamington jobs. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, judging by her, the, the, her supplementary question, I'm not sure if she's proposing to do what her government did in the 1990s, which is to close our international trade missions, because we're not going to do that. We, we believe that it's important. In fact, the future of Ontario businesses is to find those, uh, those opportunities overseas in the emerging and new economies to be able to increase their the jobs here in Ontario, to find for their services, goods, other opportunities. But we're working hard with the employees, the union, the labour the labor representatives, as well as the local businesses and the local leadership in Heinz in, in Leamington to do whatever we can to make sure that uh, that there are opportunities for these employees going forward. And as I mentioned, I'll be there tomorrow. Uh, my ministry is already on the ground. Training colleges and universities is there working with the union employees. We're working hard to make sure that this is a positive result. Thank you. And your question, the member from the North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My my, my question is for the Minister of Development, of Economic De Development. Environmental engine of job growth, a cornerstone of our economy. It's been estimated that something on the order of about 99% of Ontario businesses are in fact small or medium-sized. Of course, I see this vividly as I tour my own riding of Etobicoke North, as we have quite a vibrant business sector in addition to our residential areas. These enterprises are encouraged and heartened to learn that our government's plans for jobs and growth will support small business, cut red tape, and invest in infrastructure necessary to create a dynamic and innovative business climate. From my briefings, it's clear that the Supporting Small Business Act is part of this plan. Speaker, can the minister please inform this chamber about this act, its impact on the bottom line of small businesses in my riding of Etobicoke North and broadly across the province. Thank you, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you to the member for his question. And he's right that small businesses are critical to the strength of our economy. As jobs minister, I've had the privilege of meeting with many, many business owners right across this province. They're moving our economy forward. Their innovation is not only making our economy more dynamic, but it is creating jobs. Mr. Speaker, this is why our government wants to offer every support we can and incentives to help make doing business in this province easier. That's why we've introduced Bill 105, the Supporting Small Businesses Act. This act will cut taxes for 60,000 small businesses, Mr. Speaker, and eliminate that tax altogether for 90 per cent of the small businesses in this province. Businesses behind this bill, Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business supports this act. They've said, by passing Bill 105, you have the opportunity to demonstrate your commitment to supporting the province's job Job creators. This is Answer. their press release, and Mr. Speaker, I've got additional uh, uh, issues that I'll, I'll address in the supplementary. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister. I appreciate your comments uh, regarding these long sought after changes to the Ontario tax regime, and I get right to the point. What is the importance of finishing third reading, passing this bill, and proclaiming this as Ontario law? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, not passing this legislation before the House rises means that tens of thousands of our small businesses will have to pay higher taxes in the new year. More taxes means less money to spend on expanding their operations, on going global and on hiring youth. It means less growth, Mr. Speaker, for our economy. We've already eliminated 80,000 regulations pertaining to businesses. We've launched our $295 million youth job strategy. We've eliminated the small business surtax, the capital tax. Mr. Speaker, I call on all my colleagues in this legislature to support the Supporting Small Businesses Act to make our economy stronger and make doing business for the entrepreneurs and business leaders that contribute so much to this province. Thank you. New question, the member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, uh, Speaker. To the Minister of Health. Speaker, it's been uh, some two years that we've heard from the Minister of Health that all is well at Orange. Here are yesterday's headlines from the Toronto Star. Orange endangered helicopter pilots, federal probe says. Order. The Globe and Mail. Orange's lack of training endangered pilot safety, federal report says. From the Toronto Sun, next tragedy inevitable unless service stripped of air operations. And, Speaker, today we find that last Friday there were no helicopters available in Thunder Bay, in Moosonee, and in Kenora due to helicopter pilot shortage. And we continue to hear from frontline staff that the air operations of Orange are in serious trouble. Question. Speaker, three federal reports 
continuous input from front lines, why does this minister not acknowledge that the aviation aspects of Orange should be outsourced? Thank you. Even the CEO agrees Thank you. with that. Thank you. Minister Thapong, uh, well, Speaker, I, I have to say that, um, that there's an, been an extraordinary change at Orange, and change does take some time. But I have to say that the new leadership team at Orange is extraordinary. It is an exceptional group of leaders, Speaker. I believe that even the member from Newmarket Aurora has on several occasions acknowledged uh, the skills and the expertise of that new leadership. They are doing their work. I have confidence in them that they are doing the right thing, Speaker. And, uh, you know, when I look at uh, someone like Dr. Andrew McCallum, who is prepared to come and work as president and CEO of, uh, of Orange, spe uh, Speaker, he came to that job when it was a very difficult organization to take over. He is an exceptionally well-qualified person with experience in trauma, Answer. Speaker, uh, with experience as a pilot. Yeah. This is a man who is leading real change at Orange, and I think it would be appropriate that Thank we support that change. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, then why doesn't the minister listen to Dr. McCallum? Here's what Dr. Andrew McCallum told the Public Accounts Committee two weeks ago when I asked him if divesting the aviation operations of Orange will be considered as part of his strategic plan. I quote from Dr. McCallum's testimony, the short answer is yes. We're open to all models. Proper strategic planning should consider all aspects of what the company does and what's best for the mission that the company is trying to achieve. Why isn't she listening to Dr. McCallum? The CEO is willing to look at all options, but when I put the same question to the minister just days after that, her response was an emphatic no, we will not do that. Would the minister tell us, would the minister tell the pilots and the paramedics and Dr. McCallum why she is preempting Orange's own strategic plan to consider outsourcing the Thank aviation you. operations of Orange? Thank Will you. she do that? As speaker, I would urge the member opposite to actually take a look at Hansard. What he suggested that we do is privatize Orange. I tell you, we are not going to privatize Orange. The member opposite, has, I would say you check Hansard. Check Hansard, Speaker. Uh, you know, the, the, there, is a, um, there is an ideological event, Speaker, on the party opposite to privatize services. They privatize the 407. Uh, I think we all know that we have lost billions of dollars in revenue as a result of that scheme. Uh, they, they, they had a failed privatization of uh, hydro. The rate skyrocketed, 30 per cent, Speaker, because of that commitment to privatize. I take advice from Dr. McCallum. Your question was about privatizing Orange, and privatizing Orange is not an, a plan, Speaker. Thank you. Your question? Uh, from Windsor to Comsey. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Good morning, Minister. Because there was no ministry oversight, hundreds of deficient girders were installed along the Herb Gray Parkway. It happened because there was no clause in the P3 construction contract that called for independent testing and inspection reports to be sent to the ministry. Today, the highly respected Canadian Council of Independent Labor Laboratories claims dozens of other road and bridge contracts also lack this independent testing clause. Will the minister investigate and report to this House on all MTO and Infrastructure Ontario construction contracts that do not require independent safety testing and inspection reports? Thank you, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank, thank you very much, and good morning to you, uh, my friend from windsor um, the, uh, we We actually have gone through in the last several months, we have inspected every girder production facility. All MTO projects are tested. Uh, as you obviously know from the Windsor experience and others, we do do destructive testing when necessary. I have met with this very respected body. We've had a number of conversations. Uh, I have asked them uh, to deliver their criticisms in a paper. The uh, ADM, uh, Jerry Chaput, has, uh, has reviewed this. Uh, and I think that's 
Well, I appreciate their concern. I don't think that's a fair representation of the facts. There is uh, systemic. There will be tougher uh, rules and regulations as a result of what happened in Windsor-Essex, but I also want to point out uh, is all of those girders were tested Answer. twice and are being removed and paid for by the private company uh, at full cost recovery. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, let's admit it. The P3 experiment with the short warranty periods has failed. Let's get back to the old proven method of requiring independent testing and inspection with the results given not to the contractor minister, but to the people paying the bills. Face it, public safety may be endangered here. Taxpayers may be faced with the cost of repairing or replacing this infrastructure years earlier than expected. Will the minister end this failed warranty experiment and direct MTO and Infrastructure Ontario to ensure all infrastructure projects require independent safety testing? Thank you, Minister. Um, Mr. Speaker, while I, I respect my friends in the third party, there's a very good reason I'm not a member of that party, and it's because of the ideological bent. Um, and, uh, and this is a classic example of it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have had we have had over 80 AFP projects, Mr. Speaker. Over 80. All of them have been under budget. All of them have delivered billions of dollars of savings. And when there's been errors, the private sector has had to pay for it. In spite of the evidence, the ideological bent of the NDP won't allow them to be pragmatic enough to realize this has been a huge success. So the party of pragmatism over here always enjoys the blinkers of the right and our left. And this is another one of those old ways we always Answer. used to do it. Lack of innovation, which is why they're the third party, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. New question, the member from Scarborough Asia question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. This week, in my riding of Scarborough Asian Court, <laughs> students are participating in bullying prevention and awareness week activities. We have all heard heartbreaking stories where students have been bullied by the peers, and some of us in this House may have experienced bullying firsthand. Mr. Speaker, bullying is a serious issue affecting the learning and it must be addressed. This week, we all need to take time to not only raise the awareness about bullying in our schools, but also look for ways to prevent it from occurring. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can she share with the House what action our government is taking in stopping, but more importantly, preventing bullying in our schools? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for um, Scarborough Asian Court for raising this court, um, important issue. The member's absolutely right, Speaker. Prevention plays such an important role in combating bullying in our schools, which is why almost two years ago we introduced legislation, Bill 13, the Accepting Schools Act. For the first time ever, we define bullying in legislation so that every student, every teacher, every principal, and every parent knows what we are talking about when we say bullying is not okay in our schools. The Accepting Schools Act requires school boards to develop a bullying prevention plan. It must be created in consultation with local communities communities and made publicly available. And schools are also required to conduct school climate surveys to check on the effectiveness of their bullying Answer. plans. Speaker, all members of the school community need to be involved in, in promoting respectful and caring relationships <coughs> to make sure that every student feels safe and Thank accepted. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the minister for her response. Very appropriate to her response. We have in the gallery there a bunch of young students, nice. visitors, and we're talking about issues affecting your classroom and your schoolyard, and that's the right thing to do. Minister, you have outlined some of the initiatives on how our government is addressing bullying in our schools and bullying preventions. However, Mr. Speaker, we see and hear that more and more bullying go beyond the classroom and a schoolyard. Technology have allowed bullying to follow the students wherever they go. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she share with the House what action our government is taking to confront the growing and troubling problems of bullying affecting our students? Thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you, Speaker. And cyberbullying has been a concern of our government for many years. That is why the Accepting Schools Act explicitly defines cyberbullying as a form of bullying. And in fact, our education 
Education Act already stated that if a principal believes that actions which occurred online had a negative impact on the school climate, the principal has the authority to take action, i.e. discipline the responsible students. Speaker, I was also pleased to learn just yesterday that the federal government will be dabling legislation to amend the criminal code to combat cyberbullying. I know my colleague, the Attorney General, and our government have been calling on the federal government to make it an offense to distribute intimate photos or video recordings of a person without Answer. that person's consent. Speaker, these are all important steps being taken to combat bullying. We are all responsible for combating bullying in schools and in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you. Your question? The member from Central North. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question today is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, the highly successful Red Seal program has allowed tradespeople holding certificates of qualification in their respective provinces to have mobility in their trades. These Red Seal, Red Seal holders achieved a higher standard in their examinations. Only Quebec does not participate. We all know what's going on in Quebec. A very credible contractor right here in Ontario has hired a Red Seal plumber from BC. He came back to Ontario to help his ailing father. Now we find out that under the College of Trades and their trades equivalency assessment, that it will take a minimum of six weeks before he can work and a fine of up to $10,000 for both him and the employer if he works at all during that six-week period. Are we not trying to create jobs here in Ontario? You know, we, enough is enough of this nonsense, of this ridiculous red tape and bureaucracy. What are we going to tell companies like this? They need the help now. They've Question. got a qualified person that can do the work now. Will both your Liberal government and your, and your NDP friends agree that we have to finally abolish this Liberal Thank move angle once and for all? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think what the member opposite is trying to do is every challenge that exists in the skilled trades, Mr. Speaker, and apprenticeships or anywhere in, in that sector is the, is the fault of the College of Trades. Mr. Speaker, there's been challenges between uh, provinces in terms of uh, ensuring that we can, we can have uh, have our workers flow through our, our apprenticeship programs and our Red Seal programs, Mr. Speaker, uh, for a very long period of time. And the provinces, in fact, and the federal minister are working together to try to resolve those issues. Mr. Speaker, for the life of me, I don't know why the member continues to be obsessed uh, with trying to do away with the calls of trades. Why would he be against a, a body that's going to provide greater consumer protection for those that hire skilled trade workers? Why would he be against self-governance for this industry, something that traditionally conservatives are in favor of? Why would he be against an industry, Mr. Or a, a body, Mr. Speaker, that's going to promote the skilled trades uh, to our young people? Answer. I can go on, Mr. Speaker. I'd be happy to, but I think you're going to tell me to close off very soon, so oh, I'll stop no, now, and I'll finish my, uh, now. my, my discussion in the supplementary. Yeah, supplementary. Well, Speaker, Mr. Minister, the, the trades equivalency assessment has been done by the College of Trades. It wasn't done before. You created this monster. I didn't give you the name of the contractor, and you know why? Because we're afraid your enforcement cops will go out and harass them. And that's what they're doing. The fact you even have a trades equivalency assessment is an insult to the highly skilled Canadian tradespeople. These people want to work in our province. You know, we, you know, we're losing Heinz, we're losing Cliffs, we're losing all these different companies. This guy actually wants a job, and he's got a job to go to. So now, because of so much negativity at, uh, at, around the College of Trades, we now know that you've hired an expensive communications department down there. We'd at the, by the way, at the expense of the tradespeople. So, no, it's not David Tabucci. It's an, a whole group, a whole new group of communications people down there, to, trying to deflect the letters to the editor. They, they're wanting Pat Dillon to write to the right to write to, right to, right to letters to the editor to try to deflect the negativity around the College of, the, of the College of Trades. The, First of all, let's uh, tone it down. Second of all, comments to the chair are most appropriate because then I can deal with the heckling. So don't respond to it. Uh, wrap up, please, and we'll go to the minister. So, minister, we now know that you and your NDP friends are fighting for the working family's money. But can't you all agree that it's time to join with Tim Hudak and the PC caucus and get rid of this ridiculous College of Trades?
You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, you know, for the life of me, I don't know why the member would be opposed to all the good things the College of Trades is doing. He points to things that have been in existence long before the College of Trades came along and thinks that somehow, just because we set up a College of Trades, those challenges will somehow mysteriously disappear. There are still challenges, and the College of Trades, in conjunction with our government, in conjunction with provinces and territories across the province, will continue to work on those issues. But, Mr. Speaker, why would he be opposed to our, our efforts through the College of Trades to crack down on the underground economy? That's something, Mr. Speaker, that skilled trades people want us to do. Why are you trying to get in the way of that? Why would you be opposed to, to the College of Trades' efforts to ensure that our workplaces across this, uh, this province health Answer. and safety is being maintained? Why, do you want, why would you be opposed to our efforts to protect those who have worked so hard to get their credentials? Mr. Speaker, it's time to stop playing politics. Thank you. It's time to stop working with our skills. Thank you. New question. The member from Park Dale High Park. Thank you, Mr. S uh, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Jimmy Velgakis, my constituent, has diabetes and is on a hunger strike outside the WSIB office. He's also 72 years old. It's been 10 days and Jimmy is ill. His lawyers and all of us are frightened that we will lose him. Two years ago, WSIB made a promise to Jimmy that he would get a fresh hearing based on the merits and justice of his case, but that promise was broken. As you know, I am also fasting along with Jimmy because no response from WSIB has been forthcoming, none whatsoever, and I've tried. Minister, will you step in to save Jimmy's life? Mr. Labor. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for asking the question. Uh, I, I share the member's concern about uh, Mr. Wolgakis's uh, uh, health uh, and his safety, and I urge uh, the gentleman to end uh, his under hunger strike speaker uh, in order to sustain and of course protect uh, his health. Uh, the member opposite and I have spoken about this uh, issue, uh, speaker. Uh, the member knows that as the Minister of Labor, I'm not able to get involved in the particulars of a case. I cannot speak about the issues and the merit uh, of the case. Uh, both the WSIB and the uh, workplace uh, Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal are an arm's length uh, agencies, and it will be highly inappropriate for me to speak uh, in, in any detail, in any specifics about yes, the sir. merits and issues of, of this case. Uh, I just really hope that Mr. Wilgakis and the hunger strike uh, and be able to uh, get back Thank to uh, health. Thank you, Speaker. Commentary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Vilgakis, Jimmy, is a man of great dignity and great commitment. This is the second hunger strike he's been on in two years. He's not going anywhere. So I know what the rules say, but I think this is a situation that calls for compassion and calls for justice and calls for someone to act, especially this minister, outside of those rules if necessary. Uh, on Tuesday, the OFL is staging a rally in support of Jimmy. There will be hundreds out on the street in front of WSIB. Civil Liberties has also been involved. To settle Jimmy's case wouldn't cost a lot of money. We're talking about a fairly small amount here. More to the point, at this point, and particularly in the season, Mr. Speaker, we're leading up to Christmas. Question. I'm asking you, how much is your ministry's promise worth? I'm also asking, how much is a life worth to your ministry? Minister. Um, uh, speaker, uh, again, uh, I'm very concerned about uh, the health of Mr. Volgakis, and, and uh, I, I urge the member opposite that I think we need to convince Mr. Volgakis to end his hunger strike. Uh, his health is far more important and paramount than anything else. Speaker, my understanding is that that his uh, his claim uh, was heard by WSIB now in uh, two instances. Uh, it has gone to uh, to appeal. Most recently, there was a, a second review that was done in 2000. Uh, in 2012, there were two hearings that was done, and a decision was rendered. Speaker, earlier this year. Uh, he still have a recourse to further request a reconsideration Answer. to the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal, and of course, 
uh, judicial review at the Superior Court of Justice. But I think what's most important, Speaker, for all of us is to urge him to end this hunger strike uh, and, uh, and be safe and healthy. Thank you, Speaker. I have uh, one shout out, and that is uh, the member from Mississauga East Cooksville is celebrating a birthday today. So happy birthday. <laughs> Third vote. This house stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.